My name's David Adams. My work as a photojournalist takes me to some of the most remote places on Earth. This time, it's to a frozen wonderland that defies description. For years, it's been a closed country, and now it still remains one of the last unexplored places on Earth. This frozen waterfall sums up Kamchatka, a place of temperate summers and Arctic winters. And I'm here on a special mission. I've come to meet some remarkable relatives of the first Americans. The Indians of Russia's wild east. To find them, I must cross a corner of Siberia so cold that death strikes the unprotected in a few hours. And as I go, I discover some of the Cold War's darkest secrets as I enter the Forbidden Zone. Even by Russian standards, Kamchatka is remote. It's so far from Moscow that you cross nine time zones to get here. It's a land of volcanoes, glaciers and permafrost, where temperatures of less than minus 50 degrees are commonplace. It's a peninsula, a thumb-shaped landmass about the size of California, thrusting south from Siberia towards Japan. My route takes me across this frozen waste, starting in Kamchatka's capital, Petropavlovsk. There's little to recommend Petropavlovsk, with its dreary factories and ugly Soviet apartment blocks. Once a sleepy fishing village, it was transformed into a Cold War arsenal. From the end of the Second World War until the fall of the Soviet Empire, Petropavlovsk was a top-secret military base. It was here they kept their nuclear submarine fleet. It wasn't just Petropavlovsk. The whole peninsula was forbidden territory. Kamchatka had become an off-limits exclusion zone. In 1983, Korean Airlines flight KL-007 strayed off course with 269 innocent passengers aboard. It was accused of flying a spying mission and shot down in Kamchatkan airspace. There were no survivors. What's so incredible is that I'm here at all, a Westerner taking photographs of what was once one of Russia's most secret military areas. It's kind of like being in a Cold War spy novel, but it really just shows how much things have changed here. A few years ago, if I was caught doing this, it would have meant a trip to the Gulag. So the Cold War was actually good to Petropavlovsk. Maybe it's why they didn't remove this colossal statue of Lenin. But since the collapse of the Soviet Empire, the city's fallen on hard times. Gone the huge military infrastructure. Gone the cash flow to support the Soviet war machine. A few years back, the city was so broke, its electricity supply was cut. They had to use a nuclear submarine for emergency power. But there was a time when things could have been very different. The irony is that this bastion of communism almost became part of the United States, not once, but twice. In 1867, when America bought Alaska from Russia, 
Kamchatka was also up for grabs, but the Americans didn't want it. Then in 1920, Lenin was so broke, he offered it to an American millionaire on one condition. It must remain communist. Again, America refused it. But I want to go back to a time long ago, long before there was any Russia or America, back to a time when humans first roamed the Earth. About 16,000 years ago, they crossed from Russia to Alaska to become the first humans to enter the Americas. Later, some of them may have wandered back to Kamchatka, where their descendants remain to this day. These are the people I want to meet, the closest living relatives of Native Americans, Siberia's Indians, hidden deep in Russia's wild, wild east. So I hitch a ride from Petropavlovsk along the road. There's only one road in Kamchatka, and the further we go, the less it looks like a road. And at the end is Avangai, population less than 500. It's here that I meet my companions. This is my interpreter, Renat, a former Soviet submariner. With him is Victor, our wilderness guide. What, uh, what problems does Victor see over the journey? And here's something I wasn't expecting. Grizzly bears about to emerge from winter hibernation. Well, it will be very difficult because of uh, due to the very deep snow. And besides of this, there is just uh, we can meet the, even the bear. Oh, really? Yeah, just, that's early. It's uh, because of spring. Yeah, yeah. bears they usually in spring they're very hungry, you know, and just very cruel. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, isn't the only thing you've got to worry about bears is you've just got to run faster than the next boy? <laughs> and what's this? Aircraft infringing upon non-free flying territory may be fired on without warning. Once more, I'm reminded of Korean Airlines flight KL007. Is this, this still the case? It's quite possible. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm not taking to the air quite yet. This will be our transport, snowmobiles. Is this us, Yeah, yeah. At the moment, this one seems to be carrying the entire population of Avangai below the age of 10. How are you? How are you? good. Hi guys! Now I've written snowmobiles before, but never Russian ones, and they don't inspire much confidence. But they're anxious to lend me this one. So he's happy for us to, uh, to use it for a few days? Yeah, you're welcome. Good, okay, thank you very much. Alexa. We pack with extra care. Once we leave, there's nothing but snow and more snow. Our lives depend on what we bring. At last we're ready. Or are we? And so the journey begins. I think there's something wrong with this. Maybe I flooded it. Maybe I hadn't quite got the knack. Or maybe it's just busted. There's a suspicious amount of wires here hanging around not doing anything. But uh, it's probably better happening here than out there. Before long, there's a complete mechanical strip down underway. And I hope they know what they're doing, because I don't. 
The more they strip it down, the more I realise they do know what they're doing. Because they have to. We're a long, long way from the spare parts store, if there's one at all. The minutes turn to hours. Then suddenly, a real Cold War erupts. Me against the entire Avangai school-age population. I think I've started World War III here. I know who's winning. Not me. Then finally, Russian ingenuity overcomes the problem. At last, we're on our way. As we leave Avangai and head for the tundra, I realize I'm going where few Westerners have dared venture in this forbidden realm. Soon, I'll be lost in an icy wilderness with a sad Cold War legacy. Here, I'll meet a dying people, slowly being poisoned by nuclear radiation living deep in the Forbidden Zone. It's spring in Kamchatka, in the Russian Far East. But even in April, temperatures can drop well below zero. I'm looking for the Evan Reindeer Herders, a tribe with close links to American Indians. It's hard to accept that parts of this beautiful wilderness were once used by the Soviet Union to test weapons of mass destruction. But it was, and amazingly, people still live here in what was once the Forbidden Zone. Somewhere out here is a place called Tabun, where a remote tribe called the Evan keep their reindeer herds. We're making good progress and I'm getting the hang of my Russian snowmobile. And I'm glad to say it hasn't missed a beat. The Evan are nomadic. Maybe they're in Tabun, maybe not. That's if we can ever find Tabun. It's rather like searching for a snowflake on a glacier. And then we see them, hundreds of reindeer. But life for these reindeer is not easy. Out on the tundra, wolves wait to pick off the young and the weak. Day and night, the herd needs protection. It needs this man. He's called Kyriak. Kyriak is a legend among the Evan. A child of the tundra, he's been a reindeer herder all his life. And as an Evan tribesman, he's so closely related to Native Americans that there's even a genetic link. In Soviet times, the herd was a collective farm. Now it's a tribal cooperative with private investors. But whatever it was, or is, Kyriak is still the boss. And how many, how many reindeer does he have here? Kyriak, how many reindeer does he have here? 1,300, 1,200. 1,300 approximately. 
There's no shortage of reindeer in Kamchatka, but there's a distinct shortage of Evan tribesmen. With only around 1,500 of them left on the peninsula, it makes Kiriak a bit of an endangered species himself. Now this is one way of making yourself popular with reindeer, urinating. Licking urine is their only source of salt. But watch out for those antlers. It's the mating season and two stag reindeer fight over a female. Their antlers have become hopelessly locked together. This is the downside of having beautiful antlers. If squabbling reindeer can't disentangle themselves, both may lie there until they die. So the antlers have to be broken. Once separated, it's time for my initiation into one of the finer arts of the wild, wild east. Reindeer roping. So this is how they, they catch uh, reindeers with such uh, equipment. So he's a Kamchatkan cowboy. You're a Kamchatkan cowboy. Try it. Try it. You may even catch one. Ah, okay, we'll see how we go. Посмотрим, как пойдет. Now you might think this is easy. Toss a lasso into a forest of antlers and you can't miss. Surely it must find a hook. But it doesn't work like that. Not once, not twice. And I wouldn't get a third chance. Now it's Kiriak's turn. But even legends have off days. There's hope for me yet as a reindeer herder. In the end, it's his nephew Sergei who gets the deer. And while to us it all may look like a reindeer rodeo, to the Evan it's a matter of survival. This is what they'll live off for the next week. With speed and efficiency, they butcher the reindeer. This may all seem a bit gruesome, but actually, mm -hmm. this happens in slaughterhouses around the world every day. Out here, they've been doing it for thousands of years, naturally, just like this, and living off it. David, a reindeer carcass will last for days, and out here, you don't need a freezer. Nothing is wasted. The skin, the entrails are all put to good use. And right now, Kiriak helps himself to a real Evan delicacy. This is the tendons, huh? <laughs> I think he's saying that's the sweetest part of the meat there. As an honoured guest, I'm not forgotten. Actually, I must accept. 
whether I like it or not. Well, well this is about the most nutritious thing you can eat out here, the marrow of these bones. No, I'm not uh, uh -huh. particularly partial to uh, raw meat, but uh, this is something I figure I have to do. Is it good? Okay. Well, it doesn't really taste like anything. It's uh, just a sort of a fatty meat taste. But I'm sure it's actually very, very good for me. But as I soon discovered, it's not as good for me as I thought. No, okay. For nearly 50 years, the Soviet Union used Kamchatka what for it? nuclear testing. What it? What it? What it? The resulting fallout still contaminates the soil, which contaminates the grass, which contaminates the reindeer, which in turn are eaten by the herders. Not surprisingly, their cancer rates are 10 times the national average. Vitamin. Thanks to the Cold War, reindeer meat is slowly killing the herders. That night, we stay in Kiriak's yurt, which not surprisingly is similar to an American Indian teepee. Dinner is reindeer, reindeer, and more reindeer, radioactive or otherwise. Oh, okay. So what, what is this here? It's a It's a, it's a, it's like a <laughs> sort of uh, liver or not, not liver, liver okay. just, uh, with lots of salt in it. Lucky. Do they worry about the nuclear testing that was here in the food? Kiriak, содержание в оленине или этого нету? Since this is his diet day in and day out, you'd have thought he would have been a little concerned. Yeah, oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very clean and natural pro product, so you don't worry about it. So they don't, they, don't, they don't think there's any problem no. from the years before? Yeah. Oh. For Kyriak, the fact that they may be eating radioactive reindeer is of little consequence. Besides, it's not the Evans' only health problem. Mm -hmm. How do they call this uh, disease which has uh, destroyed your teeth? How do they call it? Kiriak means scurvy, a disease the rest of the world had almost wiped out two centuries ago. It's caused by lack of vitamin C. Because they eat too much meat. But it's preventable by eating fresh vegetables or drinking orange juice. However, fresh vegetables don't grow in this climate and orange juice isn't easy to come by out here. So as the vodka flows in the sub-Arctic twilight, we toast our cares away to the distant howl of the wolves. To good health. Tomorrow, an old Soviet armored vehicle comes to my rescue as the forces of nature conspire against me. I push still further into the forbidden zone as I search for another people of the Siberian tundra. Dawn on the Kamchatkan Peninsula in the Russian Far East. My guide Victor, stripped to the waist, honors the rising sun. And in the frigid air, the youngest herdsman, Alexei, returns. He's been up all night guarding the reindeer from wolves. This place is taken by the chief herdsman, Kiriak, 
who takes the day shift. The herd needs protection all the time. His skis are homemade. Without them, he'd sink into the snow. The bases are lined with reindeer fur, so when he climbs hills, he can grip the snow. And as I try to give my own skis a run, I wish I had Kyriak skins in this world without ski lifts. The ski lift to the right! To the Evan, climbing hills just to ski down them must seem utter madness. And as it turns out, that's just what it was. <laughs> well, that wasn't quite what I expected. Looks like a lovely mountain full of powder or spring snow, but actually it's full of what's called sugar snow, big holes of stuff just like sugar. So when you ski down, you get a few good turns and then boom, straight into a big deep hole. So uh, those tracks aren't quite what I intended leaving, but it was still good fun. Skiing anytime's great. But right now, sugar snow is not the problem. It's more a case of no snow at all. This has been one of Kamchatka's warmest winters on record, and the thaw is arriving early. Mm. Well, the bad news, he said that it will be absolutely impossible for us to go further by snowmobiles. Well, there's, there's no snow? There is no absolutely uh, no snow. Just spring in full force, in the full speed there. My route is supposed to take me to the west coast and the remote settlement of Kovaram. Though without snow, our snowmobiles are useless. But we're not defeated yet. He's going to make a radio transmission. Every day, the reindeer herders power up their hand crank radio and contact the tribal office. For months on end, it's their only link with the outside world. Maybe there's another way of getting us across the mountains. Maybe one of the regular supply vehicles can be diverted to pick us up. It can, though I wasn't quite expecting one like this. In Russia, old Soviet army vehicles never die. They just get sent to Kamchatka, where they become an indispensable form of transport in a world without roads. Okay, we've got everything inside? Yeah? They're a cantankerous, dirty, but cost-effective way of carrying heavy goods. Inside, it's loaded with building materials, food, and crates and crates of vodka. Which is why we have to travel on top. With diesel fumes belching in our face, we're underway, literally back on track. It was just as well we traded our snowmobiles for this. But as we go further into Kamchatka's wild interior, we find the thaw is well underway. It's already melting the river ice. Before we cross, our driver Sergei checks his track pins, some of which have come loose. We wouldn't want to be stuck in the middle of this.
When we planned to go by snowmobile, rivers were to be our frozen highways. This river we cross comfortably. The others may not be so easy. Further on, the thaw is even more advanced. Sergei assures me that these vehicles are supposed to float. But with the rising waters, I'm not sure if this is quite the time to find out. We manage this river just and there's deeper yet to come. So with the way ahead once more blocked by the Thor, we divert to the town of Esso. Tomorrow, an amazing encounter with magic as I visit another of Kamchatka's disappearing people, still clinging to their culture in Russia's wild, wild east. We board another leftover of the Soviet war machine, an MI-8 helicopter. In this I'll fly across the Kamchatkan Peninsula to Kovran, in one of the remotest corners of the Russian Far East. rise above the town of Esso, I'm slightly apprehensive. These helicopters haven't got a great safety record. Recently, one crashed killing 19 people. But the snow is melting fast. While it's melting on the lowlands, it's not melting on the mountains. Even on those which you'd normally think were too hot to handle. We're on the Pacific Ring of Fire. There are more than 200 volcanoes in Kamchatka, making it one of the most active volcanic zones in the world. At any one time, there's usually a volcano erupting somewhere, though fortunately, not this one. Right below me is a perfect slope. If I can land on the top, I can grab the opportunity to do some serious heli skiing. Somehow, I don't think these choppers were designed with heli-skiing in mind. Suddenly, I'm alone on the summit of a dormant volcano. Well, this is about as high as it gets in Kamchatka. 4,400 metres. It's a fantastic day on the top of this volcano, and the snow looks perfect. I'll see you at the bottom. I'm beginning the ski run of a lifetime. First, I pick my way through the ice-encrusted lava flows.
then a traverse across the collapsed crater. Then it's perfect powder snow. I've skied some pretty good slopes in my life, but none like this. It's the run of my dreams. I'm all alone on a volcano in the middle of this icy Siberian wilderness, thousands of miles from anywhere. It seems to last forever until I reach the bottom, where my legs finally give out. It was incredible. Oh, feels like you, uh, you're doing a mountain for the first time when you ski it untracked. An incredible doesn't describe it. <sighs> Woo! Back in the chopper and I'm on course for Kovram. Here I hope to meet the Ettelmen, a small Siberian tribe whose origins are still a mystery. When strangers land in Kovran, the whole town seems to turn out. David, did you take the rifle? Huh? Did you take the rifle? Being literally at the ends of the earth, few ever come this way. For Kovran is remote, even by Kamchatkan standards. Kovran is a depressing sight. Far from being a centre of Ettelman culture, it seems a showcase for its annihilation. The Ettelman really are an endangered species. Only 1,400 of them are left in Kamchatka. In 1917, the Soviet government forced them to leave their traditional grounds and settle here in ramshackle huts. In effect, Kovran became an Ettelman gulag. And the fall of the Soviet Union has done little to help them. <laughs> Nothing much seems to happen in Kovran. On the surface, they seem a broken people. Yet another minority group crushed under the iron fist of Soviet domination. But persecution didn't kill their culture. It just drove it underground. And now, with the Soviet Union gone, Ettelman culture is re-emerging in Kovaran. In a small hut, I meet Boris Zurikov, a shaman. With his drum, he communicates with the spirit world. And like all great shamans, Boris is famous for his healing, which is why I've come to see him. An old shoulder injury of mine has been acting up. My doctor said that I'll just have to live with the pain. But I want to try some Ettelman alternative medicine. Maybe he knows something my doctors don't. No one's ever tried treating my shoulder by squeezing my foot. Boris says that uh, when Indians are, gr are greeting each other, they touch uh, visitors' feet, and probably it's because that uh, there are a lot of pressure points which are responsible for different uh, parts of your body. Under Soviet rule, shamans were banned. If their artifacts were found, they were burnt. But somehow, Boris has hung on to the tools of his trade. Yes, that's right. And also to fill you up with uh, new energy. Which I definitely need. 
I don't know if it's the power of suggestion or positive thinking, but my shoulder is definitely feeling better. But Boris is more than just a medicine man. He's also the driving force behind the resurgence of Edelman culture. I've got much more strength. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is an ancient dance, and while it has Russian overtones, there are distinct similarities to Native American rhythms. Yet the Edelman culture is so lost in time that it's hard to say where the American influence came from. On the floor sits a bear skull, a reminder of the days when they danced to honor the spirit of a slain bear. But this is just a rehearsal. Outside, they wear traditional costumes, similar to native North American dress. And it's not just culture they're preserving, it's also their language. Only 350 Edelman speakers are left in Siberia. But according to Boris, the powerful guardians of their culture live in the forest. So if I really want to understand how Edelman culture has survived, that's where I must go. Tomorrow, I take a journey by dog sled as I delve deeper into their sacred mysteries and visit the ghosts of the Edelman past. Next morning, I set out to complete my crossing of the Kamchatkan Peninsula. Good to see you. Good to see you. These are fantastic doggies. But it's also a mystical journey. If I'm to visit the Edelman Guardian Spirits, there's only one way to get there. You know, the thing about sled dogs is you'd probably expect to see huskies out here, but they're this mixed breed of what I guess we'd call mongrels, but they're the fastest and the leanest dogs for all the running that they do out here. And uh, as you can see from their faces, there's quite a bit of wolf in them as well. It doesn't matter where you are. Put a number of dogs together, signal the concept of a walk, and they all start barking. Controlled madness this is, I think you'd call it. But uh, I think eventually we'll get somewhere. <laughs> We're off on a six dog powered sled with one puppy in hot pursuit. The Edelman are famous for making strong and extremely light dog sleds. Unlike snowmobiles, dogs don't need spare parts. Before long, our dogs settle down to a steady trot.
Boris told me that if I wanted to find the spirits of the Edelman, I must spend a night in the forest. And that means camping. During the summer months, the Edelman pitch their tents on top of platforms, balagans they call them, and sleeping on one of these can save your life. With spring arriving early, the grizzlies are stirring from their winter hibernation, and we don't want to be on the menu of any marauding hungry bear. So I suppose I'm taking a bit of a risk wandering off alone like this. Kamchatka has one of the world's highest concentrations of grizzly bears. So I hope the forest spirits will protect me. And then I see them, the Hantai, Edelman spirit poles. They look similar to North American Indian totem poles, but because of the mystery surrounding Edelman origins, no one can be sure of their connection. There's an agreement between the Atleman and their Hantai. If the Atleman look after their Hantai, the Hantai will look after the Atleman. Though during the years of Soviet persecution, the Hantai didn't seem to be keeping their side of the bargain. But now, the godless state has fallen. Atleman culture is emerging from its gulag, and the Hantai are back in favour. I leave the forest and there's my journey's end, the Sea of Okotsk on Kamchatka's western shore. It's a coast that faces Mother Russia, the past and memories of cultural repression. To the east lies America and distant cousins, now not so distant. It will take more than just a cold war to keep the Evan and the Edelman down. For centuries, they've coped with earthquakes, volcanoes, Arctic snows and winds. Empires come and empires go. But somehow, the people of the Forbidden Zone always seem to survive in Kamchatka in their icy wilderness at the ends of the earth. The